It's with great pleasure that I introduce our last speaker, Dirk Beiler, Chief of Africa Programs at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who brings with him 22 years of experience in um, conservation and development. And I have the distinct honor of calling him my supervisor um, for my fellowship at the Fish and Wildlife Service. So please welcome Dirk. Thank you. As, as Daphne mentioned, um, I'm the branch chief of Africa programs at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Formerly, I worked as the program officer for the Great Ape Conservation Fund, and so I looked carefully through every presentation today, hoping to see a great ape in it, and I don't think I saw one. Um, they're clearly, they're not, the volume of trade of great apes doesn't compare with uh, the rhinos and the uh, elephants, but it is a really important part of the wildlife trade, and because they are a slowly reproducing species, um, a small reduction in a population in a certain place can, can lead to severe problems, so I just wanted to highlight that. Uh, when Daphne and the organizers asked me to, um, to wrap things up with this presentation today, they um, made a title of Where Do We Go From Here? So after four hours of listening to the problem, I'm thinking we just need to go to the bar and have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> but unfortunately, um, that's not the case yet, so we'll have to wait for that. Um, I think today's presentations were just a really nice reflection of the multidisciplinary issues of wildlife trafficking. I think we've all come to realize that, and that uh, reducing wildlife trafficking is going to require serious commitments, not just by conservationists, by a whole range of um, other actors, judiciaries, law enforcement, economists, etc. Um, and I, th but I think the reflection of these presentations is, is really nicely done and um, reflects the, organiz the organizers and the AAAS fellows who put that. So before we go further, and just to give a chance to recognize those three individuals who had a, had a role in it, could we just give a hand to Daphne Carlson Bremer, Catherine Workman, and Roberto Delgado for organizing the forum. <laughs> so as we all know, wildlife trafficking um, won't be stopped by simply trained good wildlife managers, and the issue of wildlife trafficking is truly multidisciplinary. And addressing the problem will require change in consumer preferences, as we heard from the speakers today, for wildlife products, particularly within developed countries. So over the course of the afternoon, we have heard speakers address a range of topics. And how do we move this? The slides? Sorry? Keyboard. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, our first session today we, um, was about transnational organized crime and law enforcement, the implications for governance and security, and we heard from Crawford Allen of traffic about the importance of placing a value on the illegal wildlife trade, especially to compare with other commodities such as drugs and human trafficking, etc. And also highlighting, which many speakers did today, the human cost to wildlife trade. Um, I think there were several different speakers who talked about the human cost in terms of rangers lost, and the figure that was quoted several times was a thousand rangers killed over the last decade. Uh, Crawford also raised um, the potential importance of sanctions as a tool um, and showed a, showed a nice graph um, looking at the correlation of the impact of, of, the impact of sanctions on rhino poaching um, between 1994 and 2007 and, and suggested maybe that's a tool we should look at more closely. Um, also mentioned the Fish and Wildlife Service's efforts at the Operation Crash um, and maybe that could be a potential model for other countries to follow as well and uh, challenge us to also to think critically about the impact on the market when we um, are doing ivory crushes and ivory burns and about those seeking to profit from these, these types of activities and how that might actually impact market prices. Um, my f uh, fellow uh, colleague from the Fish and Wildlife Service, Craig Hoover, who has stepped the room so I can say all kinds of nasty things about him. Okay, right here. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Aren't you moved? <laughs> Uh, highlighted the executive order on wildlife trafficking, um, talked about the efforts to have a near total ban on elephant imports, um, and talked about new rules on regulations that are be currently prepared and will be available in the next eon, I think was what he said. <laughs> uh, Mary Rowan of USAID emphasized the importance of communities in protection activities and the need for um, particularly financial ministers and governments to make the connection between the loss of their wildlife and potential revenue streams, um, particularly through ecotourism, and the importance also of, of training and professionals um, throughout the wildlife chain. Um, then we heard um, speakers on another uh, important part of the wildlife trade is the impacts of on food security and global health. Um, Beth Cortula of the National Ocean Council um, described the challenge of illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing and seafood fraud, including jurisdictional issues 
lack of enforcement, lack of data, and more simply that sometimes um, because it occurs in the ocean versus land, the problem can sometimes be more difficult to, um, to address. Um, and also the, um, the availability of a federal register notice to, to um, provide more comments into um, guiding their future efforts as well. And John Epstein of the Eco Health Alliance talked about the opportunities for spillover and uh, adaption of pathogens introduced to the illegal wildlife trade and the issues of wildlife disease, um, including examples of SARS in China, which started in the live animal markets as well, and the pet trade, led, which led to the introduction of monkeypox into the U.S. Finally, session three um, had some excellent, whoops, excellent presentation uh, looking at some of the socioeconomic drivers and consumer demand. Um, Grace Gabriel of IFA, we saw um, look at some of the different campaigns and different possibilities for reducing consumer demand. Um, Mary Blair of the American Museum of Natural History um, provided an overview of the center's activities, look at the drivers of wildlife at different scales, and Valerie Hickey of the World Bank um, looked at the issues of wildlife trade as a catalyst um, for poverty and put an interesting statistic of $17 billion every year lost to environmental and wildlife crime, which um, shows the impact not just on wildlife but also the, on poverty as well. So last night, um, when I was thinking maybe I could add some value to this besides just summarizing what other people have already said, my wife handed me the latest ep um, issue of the New Yorker magazine. And in, the, in that magazine, there's a really nice feature article about a woman named Andrea Turkala. And what I thought about when I think of Andrea Turkala is, is, is here in the Zangabai in the Central Africa Republic. Is, this is a project that the Fish and Wildlife Service has been supporting for over 10 years is the role of individuals and activists in terms of um, addressing the wildlife, um, illegal wildlife trade. Um, Andrea has dedicated most of her life to um, looking at this one population or several populations of elephants at this, this World Heritage Site and has really brought attention to it in a way that, that no one else could. Um, and this quoting from the article, she has spent more than 20 years camped out in Zanga and Doki National Park nearby or clearing where the elephants congregate in numbers unequaled at any other site. A wryly humorous woman of 63 who wears her hair in a tightly pulled back bun, Turcalo has gained most of her expertise in the field, her only scientific credential is undergraduate degree in environmental studies from Antioch College, and she spends most of her time alone or in the company of trackers. One of the reasons she's so important is that she's a repository of observation on things that will never be repeated. Turkolo's observations revealed something more complex. Between 1,200 and 1,400 elephants use the bye regularly, but their visits are separated by weeks, sometimes years. So when I think about places like this and we think about individuals around the world, you wonder where would the Sangha Bai and these elephants be without committed individuals like Andrea Turkolo. Fish and Wildlife Service has also been supporting other individuals. Emmanuel Demerode comes to mind, who's currently the chief park warden of Virunga, but also the rangers who have uh, lost their lives um, and put their sacrifice in terms of uh, combating wild, illegal wildlife. So um, we need to look to the future, who is going to lead the effort in 10 to 15 years from now, and think about the human capital um, in addition to the short-term measures we can take as well. I'd just like to mention in, in terms of training programs and individuals, an effort that I'm really proud to be associated with at the Fish and Wildlife Service is pangolins were mentioned many times here today, and it's very clear they're part of a, a large trade. And my colleague Nancy Gelman, um, who designs our training programs in the Africa program, and um, another colleague who's part of the, um, the pangolin specialist group at the IUCM has put together a training program to look at uh, individuals that all across the pangolin um, issue, uh, wildlife pangolin trade. So looking at building capacity of a team of individuals that can look at the source country demand as well as the, the, the data collection needs in the field. And so this two-year progr training program will not only support the human capacity to deal with the trade, but also take concrete steps toward improving the conservation status. So I think these are just one of the ways and training programs that we can invest significantly in individuals who are key parts of having to deal with the wildlife trafficking issue. And last, I just wanted to mention the multinational species conservation funds that we have at the Fish and Wildlife Service as they provide key support to a lot of the species that are trafficked um, and have a, a network of field practitioners through each one of these um, acts and these funds that allow us to deliver assistance really effectively to the field. So I'm going to leave it at that. Where are we going? Um, I'm not going to provide any answers to that. I think the speakers have done very well. 
I would just add that um, individuals matter and long-term training investment in people is, is very important as well. Thank you.